Welcome to the Global Ethics Review. I'm Alex Woodson from Carnegie Council, the world's catalyst for ethical action. In this podcast series, we'll be connecting Carnegie Council's work and current events with our senior fellows, senior staff, and friends of our organization. You'll hear from leading experts on artificial intelligence and technology, migration, public health, and U.S. foreign policy and global engagement. This week's podcast is the third in the series on the COVID-19 pandemic and the ethics of global vaccine distribution. In part one, released at the end of June, I spoke with Oxford's professor Cecile Fab, and two weeks ago, we posted my talk with Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel from the University of Pennsylvania. Currently, in July 2021, COVID-19 is surging again in many parts of the world. In some nations, vaccines are widely available, so hospitalizations and deaths are down considerably from a year or six months ago. Other states, though, are still facing some of their worst days of the pandemic. They simply do not have the same access to vaccine doses. In recent weeks, the Biden administration has put in motion a plan to help distribute tens of millions of doses to some of the neediest nations. Though many have applauded the move, there is less consensus as to whether it goes far enough. Given the existing global inequities, what are the responsibilities of vaccine-rich countries to the rest of the world? What ethical considerations should guide policymakers thinking on these issues? To help answer some of these questions and to understand the state of the crisis in Latin America, I spoke with Dr. Florencia Luna. She is director of the Program on Bioethics at the Latin American University of Social Sciences, or FLASCO, and principal researcher at the National Scientific and Technological Research Council in Argentina. One note, Dr. Luna mentions COVAX several times in this talk. COVAX is a worldwide initiative aimed at equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. It is directed by Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and the World Health Organization. For more on COVAX, the pandemic, the vaccine, and ethics, you can go to carneycouncil.org. You can also find my podcast on this topic with Cecile Fab and Ezekiel Emanuel. But for now, here's my talk with Dr. Florencia Luna. Dr. Florencia Luna, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thanks to you for inviting me. Of course. So uh, I know you're currently in Geneva, Switzerland, but uh, we were just talking, I know you spent a lot of time in, in Buenos Aires uh, during the pandemic. So things are very different in different parts of the world right now. Um, how are people experiencing the pandemic in Argentina and other parts of Latin America right now? Well, as it's known, the pandemic is hitting quite uh, strongly in all Latin America. So the situation is not very good there and uh, it has been present for a long time. So, so it's quite complicated. Even countries that um, have been doing well with a vaccination process like Chile and Uruguay, which has more than half of the population vaccinated, they still have lots of problems uh, now. And not to tell you about other countries like Mexico, Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Argentina, uh, but also I know Paraguay, Bolivia, they, really the pandemic has been hitting very strongly in Latin America. And um, I think it, uh, it, it has also to do with the economic situation of these countries. Um, most of them are considered middle income countries by the um, by the World Bank, but this classification, I think, it's a bit misleading. Um, these middle income countries uh, have more than it, they have like sixty six point uh, three percent of people under the poverty line. And uh, Latin America is also a very inequitable region. So you have these middle income countries where you have a lot of poverty. So it's quite misleading this idea that these countries are doing well because you have very rich people and very, very poor people and with the pandemic, this has increased a lot. And for example, Mexico that had uh, extreme poverty of 10%, it has grown to 18%. And in Argentina, it, was, it is the same. So the situation is really, really uh, 
bad. So uh, over the past month or so, uh, President Biden has, has uh, announced a plan to distribute, um, I think, up to 500 million uh, doses of, of vaccine to, uh, to nations that need them that, that might not have the access right now. Um, I've, I've spoken with uh, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel about this plan. He had some concerns about it, but overall, he, he thinks that, that, that that's you know, the, the right thing to do, the ethical choice. So when you saw this announcement, what, what, did, what did you think? Is, is this, does this go far enough? Is, is there more that can be done? The plan as you see it now, what, what are your impressions of it? Well, I think that, uh, well, it's welcome donations, obviously, because we need a lot to have more vaccines in all the region, not just in Argentina. But I think that a multilateral mechanism like COVAX um, is better, um, though it has some problems and it has been criticized, I think it's not so difficult to improve it. And I think that that's the best way to go. So uh, I know Biden is going to, to give a lot to COVAX. I think that's the best way, but I think also we have to improve it. Maybe if you want at the end, we can come back and I can tell you how I think uh, we can improve that. I was, I, I did a, a little research project for WHO on the first phase of COVAX. So in a way, I'm, I, I think it's the right way to go, but that it's having some problems. So uh, I, I in, in that sense, I think it's it's good to have donations. It's like the second best. I think the first best would be to have a multilateral mechanism that be fair considering mostly need, not, much, not so much the proportion of population that you have. For example, we had that problem in Argentina. The national government, when they, um, distributed vaccines. They did it by the amount of population in each city or province. And the problem is that, for example, Buenos Aires has uh, much more uh, healthcare people because we have like a lot of um, clinics and hospitals. It also has a, a much more older population. So the same amount of vaccines that we're giving for Buenos Aires were not enough for that kind of population. And that's the problem of having this kind of pro proportional system of distribution. So I think that, um, and COVAX has that kind of a system in, built inside. And I think that that should be uh, modified. For example, and Dr. Emanuel was was saying that as well that uh, distributing vaccines based on proportion of population is not not the the right choice. I think I'm more uh, uh, optimistic about Covax, or I think that uh, we should try to improve it because I think that it's an important step. I don't know how much he's in that. <laughs> well, well, let's talk about that. Um, how? So a two-part question, I guess. Why, why do you think COVAX is, is the better way to distribute and what can be done to improve it? Okay. Well, uh, I think it's, it's like multilateral. So, and in a way, it, it, it has the problem that it, it accepts that countries can buy themselves and, and that in a way jeopardizes COVAX system because rich nations uh, have a better um, way of buying uh, uh, vaccines. But at the same time, it avoids a lot of pressure by the more rich countries inside COVAX. So it, it has its pros and, and cons. Um, it's focus and it tries, I think, as 
Emmanuel said, I think it's not the right way to think in equity, this proportional way, but they may ch change and think more in need, which is what we think it's better. So um, that's one of the things. Um, it, it, in a way, it, it's taking care of the most poor nations, and that's very good. I would like they consider more, as I was saying, middle-income countries, because I think those are the countries that are suffering the most at this point. Uh, it's like um, low-income countries, they will get donations. Uh, High-income countries, they can buy them by themselves. But as I was telling you, middle-income countries have a lot of poverty and a lot of structural problems, not all, but most of them, for example, in Latin America, and they are there, they cannot, uh, they cannot compete with high income countries and then they cannot get good prices. For example, uh, South Africa was complaining because they got the AstraZeneca vaccine in 2020, at the beginning of 2021, or, yeah, and it was nearly double the price that the European countries got it. So, because they do not have the, uh, the, the power uh, to negotiate as well, and maybe the amount of uh, population to do those negotiations. Another thing that I think it's very important about, uh, so COVAX has this idea of being uh, equitable. Uh, they didn't choose the, best framework. I think it has some advantages because it's more simple, less arbitrary, it's easier to see it. But I think that as we know now, we can do quite well predictions as which countries will be worst. We know that, for example, when winter comes, things get uh, harder. So th there are ways of predicting and uh, considering need in, in this case. So the other thing that COVAX has, it's, it, well, it, it allows all countries to be there. Um, and it also has something that I think it should be more exploited or more worked on. And it is this uh, building of capacity in order to, for example, produce vaccines. And I think that this is very important if you can do it uh, more regionally. They have supported a lot India and the Serum Institute. And I think that they should do the same thing in Africa, in Latin America. So we have different like centers uh, and there, yes, you have to <clears throat> seek countries that have uh, like um, a certain infrastructure in science and scientific uh, infrastructure, yeah, infrastructure. So um, in order to, to build upon that. So for example, in Latin America, you can work with Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, maybe Colombia. So you have like three or four countries that can produce vaccines and and that was really one of the bottlenecks bottleneck at, at the beginning of the distribution of the vaccines so i think that's very important um so in in this in that sense covax brings in like different angles that are very important to tackle so one is the fair distribution, another one is capacity building, another one is uh, helping or yeah, funding new vaccines that might be much more interesting for developing countries, like new ways of uh, getting the vaccines one dose, not needing so much chain, uh, cold chain. So, so I think that in that sense, and uh, the other thing that I think it's very important is having uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, uh, helping the planification, the planning, 
uh, of the vaccination program. I think that's very important to have. And um, we have had in, and we had in, we have in, in the Americas, the regional uh, part of WHO, which is PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. And there, uh, I think it has decades, the revolving fund, uh, which, which is a bit the same, uh, it has similar ideas that COVAX took uh, of uh, distributing vaccines in a more um, fair way and also uh, with solidarity, helping the countries that are uh, in, in bad shape and that cannot, um, I don't know, they, uh, I cannot think the, the word in English, but it's when you, you can like bargain when uh, if you have, yeah, very, a, a very small population, it's very difficult for you to get priority or a good price. So if you do it uh, through the revolving fund, that, that will, uh, that helps and that, that, that's been done uh, to get um, vaccines uh, more cheap, uh, more cheap uh, or, or cheaper, but also it helps planning uh, and uh, thinking beforehand how the distribution will be. And I think that's very important in order to avoid um, losses of vaccines or expirations of vaccines, which is fundamental too. It's a very scarce resource, it's very expensive, so we have to do good use of it. Yeah, that brings up uh, an issue that uh, Dr. Fab and Dr. Emmanuel both spoke about, which is uh, the issue of giving millions of doses of vaccines to nations that might not be prepared, might not have the infrastructure to, to distribute it. Um, so what, what do you do in that case? I mean, you have millions of people around the world that, that need the vaccine, but, but might not have, you know, just because of where they were born, the government might not be able to carry that out. So what, what do you do in that situation? And how, how are you thinking about that right now? Well, uh, I think that we have to work more, uh, as I was saying, through this kind of multilateral mechanisms that brings in also this capacity building for very little countries that do not have this possibility. The other thing that happened with COVAX at the beginning uh, and with the distribution of COVAX was that they were distributing well, to some African countries that we can say from what we call rectificatory justice that were always forgotten and they didn't have the possibility of having vaccines and, and we can welcome that, it's very good. But uh, in at the time, while well, there are some other countries that are not doing really well, that they have uh, like thousands of deaths and millions of cases, it's a little bit um, unfair to lose those vaccines to, for countries that do not need them at the time. So, and that was what happened with, for example, Latin America, Peru was burning and uh, COVAX was giving, I don't know, to Cote d'Ivoire, to, um, um, Ghana to other countries that weren't in so much need. So I, I think that in this sense, COVAX has to rethink how to, to do this distribution in order to be, uh, to be at the point of really being equitable as, uh, as they want to. So I think that, that that's part of the, um, the issues. So I know you've been uh, thinking about this and writing about this uh, for a while, along with your colleagues. What is your sense that COVAX is uh, is, is is taking your advice and is, is is listening to your concerns and maybe other governments? Because um, you're you're talking about a lot of things that that you want to improve, but we're right in the middle of this right now. So what's the process like of of trying to influence uh, these huge organizations to to try to make some changes? Well, I'm an academic, 
so though we try to publish in uh, journals that may have impact uh, and uh, I'm also, for example, our program is one of the collaborative centers of WHO. So I try to be there and I try to, to have an impact, but uh, COVAX it's quite independent from WHO. So I don't know how much we can, I, I know they are trying to do some changes. We'll have to see what happens. I think that some of the criticisms that have been levied uh, have impacted COVAX. Uh, so I hope they go to the right direction. For example, on these kind of things, I think they need to have more transparency too. So, um, uh, so I think there are two or three things that are not so difficult to improve and that they can do it now. And I think that uh, it's very important because we are still in the pandemic, it's not gone. And uh, the provisions say that there will be other pandemics. So we have to begin building something, some mechanism. I'm calling it COVAX because it's the only one that's here, maybe we need another one, but something that really can address this kind of uh, loopholes, no? these problems that are so pressing. And in a way, what we see is that as things are going now, they are not going well. No, we are not solving the problems. It's, uh, well, it's the second, summer in the uh, northern hemisphere and uh, we are seeing that people are doing more or less the same mistakes. Vaccina even rich countries cannot vaccinate all the people. I was listening to the French TV and they are quite worried. They are canceling their population not to go to Portugal or to Spain because of the new strains. So, uh, and in a way we are not going to solve it that way, not letting people move. Uh, we have to begin thinking a little bit more, uh, it's like we are seeing just here, uh, and we don't have a long sight in order to see that here we are all together. And if you leave Brazil or Argentina or South Africa alone, they, they will bring these trains and all the work you are doing in these um, high income countries will be useless because you will continue to put restraints on people, you will continue. So that's part of the problem. Um, I, I was discussing with colleagues uh, the situation and they were telling me, well, but rich nations do not have the incentives to like uh, donate uh, or to immunize only uh, 25, 30% of their populations and begin sharing. And I think they do not have, because they are having like short sight and they are not seeing the real problem. And the real problem is that they cannot get back to normality. Even if they vaccinate the whole populations 100%, you will still be fearing your neighbors because the world is global and it's impossible to restrain the, it, restrain movement. And so it's quite complicated that way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it's not a good situation at all. And um, I imagine people in places like Argentina, Brazil, Mexico um, must not be happy with the situation. And, and I wonder what, what they think when they look at places like the United States, UK, e even France. And what, and I'm, I, I, I wouldn't ask you to speak for all everyone in Argentina, but what's your sense of how people 
are thinking about this right now, the fact that this country has the vaccine, this country doesn't. And what do you think that that means for the future? Well, I cannot speak for all the people. Uh, I, there are many people from Latin America, not only Argentina, that are going to the United States to get the vaccines, the people that have the means to do it. And there is like a debate, like, should they do that? And so some people say, well, they, they should, because in that way they are leaving an extra vaccine in Argentina. And others says, well, but that's unfair because, so it, it is a whole debate. Um, but what I think is that uh, even if we like it or not, we have to begin thinking more globally and we have to begin finding ways of trying to solve this in a more efficient way. And what we are doing now, this nationalism of high income countries and hoarding vaccines, uh, it's, uh, it's like uh, uh, shooting yourself in a way. You, you're not getting what you want to through this. So I, I think that uh, that's part of the problem. So just stepping back a little bit, um, as someone that's thought about bioethics for years and um, has worked on things like tropical diseases, vulnerable populations, um, when did you see did you see the issues these issues connected to the pandemic coming? Did you kind of predict that this was 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 going to happen when the COVID nineteen pandemic started? This nationalism, this hoarding of the vaccines. Um, I, I'm just wondering how you thought about this because a lot of people, this this isn't their focus and this caught everyone by surprise, but what was your thinking as, as the world got into this? Well, I didn't see it coming in, in a, for example, the, the were, there were like um, guidelines and uh, different um, uh, like proposals and essays in, in WHO, this idea of um, getting prepared for epidemics was there. So it's not that it's nobody saw it, it was there. Um, and in a way, yes, I think that we know that this is the way the world behaves, that rich countries or high income countries will uh, hoard the majority of the vaccines. And uh, for example, we have history to show us that. And that's why I think COVAX is so important because it's the first time we could build a mechanism to distribute in a fair way vaccines in less than one year. And I think that's the first time the world has been able to do that. So that's why I want to, to build upon and to improve it because it's not minor. If you think, for example, in 2009, we have H1N1, uh, which killed nearly, well, now it's nothing, 3,000, um, 300,000 people. Uh, in seven months, there was a vaccine, but Australia, the United States, Canada, and six other countries hoarded most of the vaccines. Uh, Mexico was really badly heated, and they tried to make a pre commitment and they didn't get the vaccines. Um, after the intervention of WHO, 10% of the vaccines were released, but it was too late. So with that history, we know, and I knew at least, and I think that in developing countries, we know how high income countries behave. So that was not new for us. Um, I think, and, and that's why uh, I try to defend uh, the importance of COVAX, because I think that is new, having a mechanism trying to, uh, to do this distribution in a fair way. 
it's not achieving it, but at least it's going the right in the right direction. And I think that that's why I think we have to, to try to reflect on it and improve it uh, and think in the short term possibilities that we can have. There are many other uh, like more fundamental changes that are more difficult to reach, like to have a, like a global covenant or kind of agreement and that's, much more difficult, but at least we can begin with this little mechanism. Yeah, that, that that's great. So, so for my final question, um, unfortunately, this won't be the last pandemic that that we face, um, that humanity faces. So, in your most optimistic view, what what's what what should we have in, in place for for the next pandemic that that we don't have now? Well, we should have a really uh, equitable way of distributing. So not based in the proportion of the population, but based on need, which countries really need, or maybe we can think in a mixed way in order to be helping also countries that are, are not so heated, but they are fearing. But we have to, for example, if you have, uh, all Latin America and you have like uh, Central Europe uh, that is being heated, well, you have to begin working with them. That's the main priority. You have to have more transparency. Um, I think that pharmaceutical companies have to have more transparency. And uh, that's a big issue, uh, how pharmaceutical companies are behaving and uh, uh, they have done a very good work regarding getting very uh, quickly the vaccines. But I think that they are not, uh, now they are not responding the way they should. Uh, so that, that's one of the problems. And as I, I was saying before, I think that uh, uh, giving more uh, uh, regional capacity building for manufacturing vaccines is something very important. Vaccines are quite difficult to manufacture. They are not like uh, drugs, normal drugs. And that's why uh, there are so many problems now, but that there are many countries in the world that can have that leading role and that can decentralize uh, a bit the situation and help. For as I was saying, I think that in Africa you can build two and help two or three countries to to have this infrastructure uh, that can be easily put to work if we have a pandemic. And the same can go for Latin America. Argentina has a lot of infrastructure, scientific infrastructures. We have had Nobel prizes. Uh, we, we, we have a tradition in research. Uh, well, many and most of the uh, um, trials that were done, for example, Pfizer did uh, a lot of, um, of research subjects were from Argentina. And then we couldn't get the vaccines. We don't know what happened in the middle. It was the government, it was Pfizer. Uh, there was a law in the middle, but so I think uh, uh, we should begin building this kind of um, regional infrastructure in order to be more uh, focused and have the capability to, to do it uh, better and some kind of multilateral uh, mechanism, call it COVAX or a new one, uh, but uh, something that uh, may help in this distribution. I think it's very good that WHO be part of it because of all this planning thing and also because of the respect that in general WHO uh, has in the world, in developing countries, uh, it's very important the work they do. So I, I think that in that sense, it is important to, to have that uh, expertise inside. So those are some of the 
things I, I, I and if possible, begin building a more uh, more of a, an institutional infrastructure for these kind of things. So maybe countries can buy uh, vaccines, but up to a certain point, and then you cannot buy nine times your population or eight times your population. So, so there's some there's some rationality in that, but that's. That's a problem of coordination, a very hard one that you can, you have to do it in a global way and where you have to get these countries to accept, to be, to have limits that uh, they want. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very, very tough and difficult situation. And it, that, I think it will take more time, but we have to begin thinking about different models. We have, for example, in the world, um, uh, decrease tabakism. There, uh, this was done after years and years of working and uh, laws in most of the countries against uh, smoking are there and we could do it. So we should think in, in, in different and innovative ways of trying to build this kind of mind. Uh, we have to also, I think, educate people in these kind of things. So they are aware, they are more conscious, they ask uh, also the governments to behave correctly. Dr. Francia Luna, thank you so much. Thanks to you. That was Dr. Florencia Luna. She's director of the program on bioethics at the Latin American University of Social Sciences and principal researcher at the National Scientific and Technological Research Council in Argentina. Thanks for listening and stay safe and healthy.